Throughout its history, America's leaders have echoed the mantra that it is a beacon of freedom and equality, that its actions abroad are based on democracy and morality, and that it's the greatest country on earth. America's actions, we've been told, have been for the greater good, that its citizens are in this together, united under the banner of one nation under God. But history tells a different story. When we think of empire, we think of ruthless civilizations like Rome, where an emperor class reigns supreme over the masses, brazenly conquering and enslaving their neighbors. But these feudal remnants linger still today, and despite the trappings, the core system of empire remains. As colonialism advanced, empires swallowed up the last indigenous lands. Most egregiously, at the Berlin Conference in 1884, European superpowers sat down at a negotiating table and divided up Africa for themselves, eviscerating the last bastion of autonomy on the continent. But as empires expanded, their appetite grew bigger than the planet. The feeding frenzy came to a head in 1914, when the rulers of competing empires led 17 million people like cattle to the slaughter. In the midst of the global massacre, empires continued to redraw the world for themselves. Under the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916, the UK and France drew their own borders in the Middle East, deciding the fate of millions and showing how arbitrary borders really are. Their unquenchable thirst for power and profit led the empires to clash again barely 20 years later, with unspeakable horrors claiming the lives of 60 million human beings culminating with the most catastrophic weapon the world has ever seen. The use of the atomic bomb against the civilian cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was a defining act of terror that cemented America's standing as military supreme. And from then on, it cast its shadow as the new reigning empire. The centers of the world's powers were left decimated, except one. And the victor built a new order under its hegemony. A club of empires formed in its aftermath, united against a common enemy, self-determination. In 1949, the US, Canada, and 10 European states formed NATO, insisting it was a defensive alliance. Yet NATO has carried out a strategy of containment through countless wars of aggression. For Saddam Hussein, possession of the world's most deadly weapons is the ultimate trump card, the one he must hold to fulfill his ambition. Organizations like the UN give the facade of civilized diplomacy and legality, but time and again it's shown that military might trumps morality. The US routinely breaks international laws and treaties with no repercussions from the international body. And when it needs UN backing for illegal wars, well, it just bullies its members for endorsement. Intervention after intervention, this growing empire has subverted the democratic processes of dozens of countries undermined the people the world over, and installed countless dictators loyal to its will. War after war, it has swallowed up or attempted to destroy any land that is not capitulated to its demands. Even within their own borders, in cases where its own people dissented, the empire deployed the military against them. Incidentally, every intervention seems to follow a similar trend. In Latin America alone, the U.S. military has intervened 56 times to determine the destiny of other nations. But let's just look at three examples. In 1944, a revolution in Guatemala overthrew U.S.-backed dictator Jorge Ubico and elected Juan Jose Aravalo in the first free elections. But his progressive reforms offended the United Fruit Company and other corporations' rule of the island. So after bombing Guatemala City, President Truman authorized the overthrow of Aravalo's democratically elected successor, Jacobo Arbenz, in 1952. The brutal display marked the beginning of a 36-year civil war ruled by U.S.-backed dictators and death squads, where 200,000 Guatemalans were killed. In the Dominican Republic, the people democratically elected Juan Bosch to power in 1962, after being ruled by a U.S. trained dictator for 31 years, whose reign is considered one of the bloodiest in all of the Americas. Just one year later, Bosch was overthrown by a U.S.-supported fascist military coup. But growing resistance led President Johnson to deploy more than 22,000 troops in the DR in 1965, killing 3,000 people and enabling the military occupation to continue for decades. Then there's Chile, where the U.S. spent $6 million to undermine leftist leader Salvador Allende before he was even elected in 1970. 
A mass movement of people backing Allende's progressive reforms terrified the establishment. So a bloody CIA coup ensued, followed by a 17-year military dictatorship by the notoriously heinous Pinochet, who carried out a reign of terror torturing 28,000, executing 2,279, and leaving countless disappeared. The U.S. rarely leaves any country it intervenes in. Now, there's an estimated 800 military bases around the world, spanning 63 countries officially. An absurd 179 exist in Germany alone. Yet the number is over 70 when you count anywhere with a sizable troop presence or combat operations. And broadening the definition to any U.S. troop presence encompasses virtually every country on Earth. I sat down with David Vine, anthropology professor at American University and author of Base Nation. You would think it wouldn't be that hard. The Pentagon actually does put together a list every year, and by the Pentagon's count, there are 686 bases outside the 50 states in Washington, D.C. But in fact, the Pentagon doesn't know for sure how many bases it has abroad. Because increasingly, uh, lily pads, uh, these bases that are also referred to as cooperative security locations are increasingly popular among military leaders and uh, military officials, Pentagon officials more broadly, and they are specifically designed um, often to obscure the presence of the United States in countries that, where if it was known that the United States base was present, they would face wide opposition. Um, so they're a troubling development in my mind because Often, lily pads are portrayed as, as very small, mm -hmm. just a lily pad. Uh, and the, one of the clear patterns of our base network overseas is that once a base is in place, it, they have a tendency to expand, uh, expand dramatically in some cases. So a base that might be portrayed as, as small and quite limited uh, in a matter of years or decades can become a billion dollar base. The Americans are told, as you just mentioned, that we're, these bases are needed to protect our national security interests. Uh, you argue the opposite is true in your book through extensive research. Why? I think that's, it's a claim that has been made since the beginning of the Cold War, and, and the entire strategy is, in my mind, an, an outdated one. People have not been forced to defend the argument that these bases overseas are necessary to defend the United States and, and to ensure global peace. These bases uh, all too often are actually increasing military tensions. Uh, I think it's worth considering for uh, people in the United States how we would feel with a foreign base on our soil or a single foreign base anywhere near the borders of the United States. You've made several case studies in your book just about the way militarism affects communities, not just the way it threatens U.S. national security and maybe American citizens, but all the cultures around the world that are being undermined by militaristic presence there. Talk about Okinawa, Japan, because you mentioned in your book, it's not that there's bases there, it's that the entire island is essentially one giant base. In Okinawa in particular, incidents of rape, murder, um, accidents involving military personnel that, of course, naturally uh, inflame local uh, anger and, and, and lead to what have been unprecedented protests in, in Okinawa, people upset about the way they're being treated by what they often see as an occupying force. And it's worth remembering that the U.S. military formally occupied Okinawa and ruled Okinawa as essentially a colony of the United States until 1972, and the, at which point the island was returned to Japan, um, but many people feel like the occupation has never ended. I wanted to speak on Guantanamo Bay. I think this is one of the most absurd examples, not only because of the t detention facility, infamously. It's a perpetual occupation of a sovereign land, and for over 50 years, um, you know, wasn't, they weren't even cashing the rent checks for, for the base. And then Raul Castro, once this normalized relations dialogue is happening, he says, give us back Guantanamo, and we have our government saying it's off the table. In, in most cases, uh, the United States is able to disguise occupation mm -hmm. through pressuring local elites, um, through the, the money expended to maintain the bases that, that keep people, enough people, enough elites happy. In 
Cuba, we see a just very transparent colonialist, imperialist occupation of a foreign land that's been going on since U.S. leaders were unabashed about declaring the United States an empire. Um, you know, the turn of the 19th to 20th century, uh, there was great pride among U.S. leaders in developing a collection of colonies and, and effectively controlling countries like Cuba, even though they weren't formally part of the United States. And this policy has essentially remained in place and, and is another egregious example of how our bases are, are all too often fundamentally undemocratic and are in direct contradiction to the, I think, the highest ideals of democracy that I think many of us in the United States would like to hold up. You also talk in your book extensively about the hypocrisy of, of this human rights rhetoric when it comes to U.S. cooperation with countries that are hosting U.S. bases. So often U.S. leaders have trumpeted the bases as spreading democracy and, and, and a force for, for good and for uh, democracy in the world when there's also a clear preference that we see the U.S. military having for maintaining bases in undemocratic countries, in rep uh, countries ruled by repressive regimes. So we see our bases all too often propping up these undemocratic, repressive, often violent regimes and actively suppressing pro-democracy movements. So uh, that is certainly part of the explanation. Many of the undemocratic countries in which U.S. bases are located are found in the Persian Gulf. The U.S. has bases in every Persian Gulf country except Iran, and large numbers of bases, a growing infrastructure that has been expanding for the last 30 years. Uh, and of course, these bases are directly related to the presence of, of oil and natural mm -hmm. gas supplies and the desire of U.S. leaders to dominate this strategically critical part of the world. Is this just the nature of empire? The economic forces in particular and the political forces have come to drive the empire. Um, US, the U.S. public has little to say about what, uh, the, how the U.S. operates around mm. the world, the wars it launches. Uh, the system has gotten out of control of any individual or any party or any individual political leader and it's the system that needs to be undermined. Eisenhower's warning about the military-industrial complex seems quaint compared to the beast it is today. Out of the 1.1 trillion U.S. tax dollars used for discretionary spending in 2015, an insane 54% or $599 billion goes purely to military expenses. To put into perspective, America spends more on its military than the next seven countries combined. Compare that to only 6% spent on education and a pathetic 6% on health care. Even more infuriating are the billions of dollars the U.S. throws at useless military toys. For example, America just bought itself a sweet $13 billion warship to fight all of our upcoming ocean battles. What else could $13 billion pay for? Oh, just over 305,000 teachers' salaries send over 1.5 million students to college for free or house 1.3 million people, more than double the amount of homeless in America. Why is such an outrageous squandering of resources acceptable? Because the empire has also installed a propaganda arm to propagate a culture of fear and militarism. But even with the corporate media at its whim, people see through the lies. Ben Griffin, a former British Special Forces soldier, talks about the fantasies versus realities of war. We were attacking families in their homes at night taking away their men to be tortured in prison. And this was the opposite of what I'd been taught um, was the, the job of a British soldier. So when I was a kid, all the films and the comic books and the stories were about us as the good guys and the Germans and the Japanese as the bad guys. Very simplistic, but it was the Germans that um, captured the Jews and, and carried out a genocide on the Jews. It was the Japanese who trapped prisoners of war badly. But here we were in Iraq doing something that looks the same as that. And you know, you talked about raiding homes, horrifying uh, tactics that were being employed. What other things did you see on the ground that completely contradicted what the establishment was telling the world what was going on? 
Yeah, I suppose my overall impression of Baghdad and the area around it at the time was this was a gold rush period. Uh, there were lots of civilian contractors, uh, Western people, all rushing about, and it seemed like there was a lot of money to be made. And, um, you know, I don't think that sense of um, that there was a theft going on, that there was something being taken there, uh, really translated back home. You know, I often think of the coffins that came back from Afghanistan and Iraq uh, and were solemnly taken off with the flag off the back of the C-130 transport plane. And they kind of gave the impression that there was a body inside, mm -hmm. you know, like a, a, a full body, you know, almost asleep. When actually, you know, if we look at the realities of modern warfare and the effects of improvised explosive devices, some of those coffins didn't have anything inside them. Some of them had bits and pieces inside them. And, you know, when we hide the true nature of warfare, we set up our next generation to follow down that path, you know, and follow those lies and, and become involved in military occupations and military invasions. When you hear just the term empire and you see that, you know, you're working British special forces and you see the American hegemon, I mean, how do you think this partnership works to kind of carry out the empire? I think there's a lot of self-interest involved in that. So America, you know, is uh, expanding its empire mm -hmm. and Britain has worked out in its own self-interest that the most uh, profitable place to be is tucked in nice and close to the American eagle. Um, because we get amazing benefits from that too, uh, in all sorts of different ways. So I think that's the kind of relationship I like to think of uh, as America, of America as Nazi Germany, and we're Austria, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's how I see it. You know, it's interesting. I mean, in the past, Britain was kind of this unabashed empire, um, you know, just openly conquering, holding colonial subjects all over the world. Has that premise really changed today? I really think the American empire has kind of like taking the place of the British Empire, but they're doing it in a much different way. So mm -hmm. rather than physically controlling it with like an imperial force and a bureaucracy, it's, um, you know, you put an American base in, you sell them some weapons, you get them to be kind of on your side, as it were, and then call in favours when, when they're required. Right. Yeah. Right. It's about um, dominating also the wealth of, of the whole area, and they're violent. You know, empires don't expand by uh, knocking on their next door neighbor's door and saying, hey, do you want to be part of my empire? I'm going to, I'm going to be in charge. Mm -hmm. You get to do what I tell you. Uh, it's always violent. Uh, and if we look at American foreign policy, it ticks all of those boxes. You know, you're, you're fighting militarism now. You've dedicated your life, Ben. You know, you defected. You faced jail time. Um, and now you're just touring around the world just speaking about the horrors of militarism and trying to stop it. Why? Why are you doing this? Uh, when we approached the uh, cemetery, I automatically assumed that these would be um, soldiers killed in battle who'd been returned. And I found out actually after speaking to Mike there that, that these aren't soldiers killed in battle. These are people who served in the military and died as civilians year later, years later, but are then given this, this uh, grand uh, military funeral. Um, and that's kind of peddling, peddling a myth to our children, you know, that, that a soldier is somehow uh, more worthy than anyone else in society and that you're going to be given this grand funeral. A lot of people within the peace movement will say, oh, you know, how many veterans are homeless? How many veterans have got PTSD? How many, vet how many soldiers were killed? I like to look at the much bigger picture, which is how many homeless people are there now in Iraq? You know, how many Iraqis have got post-traumatic stress disorder? Right. How many orphans are there? How many people did we kill and maim? You know, because that's what the real issue is. It's, it's what we've done to other people. You know, e even though my imagination was captured at a young age by the military, I still joined voluntarily. I voluntarily went to Iraq. I voluntarily went to Afghanistan. Those people that we occupied, they didn't volunteer for any of this. You know, uh, we set upon them like bullies. And uh, people back home need to realise that they need to. We, we need to try and help people to empathise with the people of Iraq, the people of Gaza, the people of Afghanistan, and get them to think. What would this be like if this was happening to me? How would I feel? Wasting tons of cash and causing mass human suffering aside, the war machine also regularly decimates the environment. In 2013, a U.S. warship tore through a protected marine and bird sanctuary in the Philippines, causing massive damage. In 2010, U.S. military construction of a base on the coast of Jeju Island, South Korea, threatened the fragile habitats of nine of the world's 66 global geoparks. 
and astounding 600 U.S. military installations across pristine Alaskan landscapes have left a legacy of carcinogenic contamination. And this past summer, the Navy again began carrying out war games in the Gulf of Alaska, detonating tens of thousands of pounds of toxic munitions and unleashing untold damage to wildlife. Like days of old, the empire only unleashes its military to protect its own power and wealth. It uses it as a battering ram for its economic policies and deploys a transnational corporate capitalist power structure, which prioritizes profit over the welfare of the planet. Through extortion and subjugation, organizations like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank have created new forms of debt slavery and colonialism. All U.S. Marines learn about Major General Smedley Butler, who at the time of his death in 1940 was the most decorated Marine in U.S. history, winning five medals for heroism. But what Marines aren't told is that Butler became one of the most outspoken critics of U.S. militarism. He said, War is just a racket. A racket is best described, I believe, as something that is not what it seems to the majority of the people. Only a small inside group knows what it's about. It's conducted for the benefit of the very few at the expense of the masses. I served in all commissioned ranks from second lieutenant to major general, and during that period I spent most of my time being a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street, and for the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefits of Wall Street. And I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for American sugar interests in 1916. In China, I helped to see it that Standard Oil won its way unmolested. 9-11 presented another golden opportunity for the empire. It exploited fear and tragedy to pillage resources across the Middle East. Its threat clear, conform to our rule, or face destruction. At home, the empire ensured a permanent war economy by institutionalizing the collusion between government and big business. In 2008, the Government Accountability Office found that a startling 52 of the biggest defense contractors employed over 2,400 former generals, senior executives, and officers. A whopping 70% of the top generals who retired between 2009 and 2011 stepped directly into positions in the defense industry. Lobbying for war is even more blatant. Of the top 10 corporate PAC donors in 2015, half were defense contractors and war profiteers. And what do you know? Turns out that the top four politicians with the most authority over defense spending are also the top four recipients of defense behemoth Lockheed Martin. The bedrock of America is the myth of democracy, that somehow empire will dismantle itself if the right leaders are elected. Then we can just go back to what the Founding Fathers intended this country to be. But America was founded on colonization, the extermination of an indigenous population, and the enslavement of an entire race, all of which laid the foundation to its rise to empire. At home, the empire rots. Economic warfare abounds. In the richest country in human history, millions sit in poverty. Militarized riot cops stalk with impunity. Racism entrenched. The surveillance state spies unhinged, and political opposition incessantly quashed. The system can't afford alternatives, and we've seen how far it will go, with no remorse. It's a machine that runs on death and destruction, killing thousands of our brothers and sisters every day. But every empire falls, and the history of empires, the history of resistance to it, where people have won time and again against impossible odds to defeat their subjugation. A world dominated by U.S. hegemony and the corporate power structure it serves is cracking. And our digital age provides the great ability to build empathy, consciousness, and global solidarity. Information is power. We need to fight to unmask the empire every day in order to stop it. And every file here is a tool that will arm us in battle. Abby Martin, logging out.